Thank you so much to everyone here at EDS Texas and the University of Houston College of Optometry. It is such an honor to be here to meet again after so many years of me being in school. And a big shout out to Marty, Jed, Stephanie, Stephanie, another Stephanie, and Mel for helping this uh, to happen today. So excited to talk to you all. We're gonna talk about today Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Autonomic Dysfunction, or POTS, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. And as many as a, of us have found out, Ehlers-Danlos can be very problematic and cause disability in many people, but when you develop autonomic dysfunction or POTS, totally different condition, am I right? Uh, we end up with things like brain fog or, or true dementia, to be honest. We see uh, gut problems, heart problems, we experience gastroparesis, constipation, ileocecal valve dysfunction, sphincter of oti dysfunction. Some of us have immune problems, totally different picture. And I think we need to take a closer look at this condition and what could be causing all of this. So I think um, we've got a drawing going for five copies of the Driscoll Theory because this is where I started to release years ago what we were finding out and that was happening to a lot of these patients. Problems like abnormal intracranial pressure, uh, mast cell problems, and the release of histamine by other cells which cannot be ignored, vascular problems, vagus nerve problems, et cetera. We were, we were missing way too much in this condition. I hope you enjoy it too because we've got chapters by physicians who are also patients, which can be a great insight to the condition. So uh, after releasing the Driscoll theory, uh, we started to peel back more and more layers. What this began as is many years ago, I was 46 years old, things were going along just fine. My, my family and I, we felt like we were healthy until I went on a mission trip overseas and got a virus, the same virus that everybody else was getting, but I didn't seem to recover and weeks later, I developed POTS, hyperadrenergic POTS. My son, when he was eight years old, had a series of three viruses, just regular old viruses from school, and he also got sicker and sicker until finally he was unable to go to school and was severely disabled with POTS. So we started to look at what the cause was. We, like many of you, were told that we likely suffered from a gradual laxity of tissue due to having Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome that eventually caused the vessels to become weak and the blood would pool. We were also told we likely needed neck fusions because of craniocervical instability and Chiari surgery, even though we didn't present with Chiari, we had all the symptoms of Chiari and it was called Chiari Zero. But our thinking was more, something happened to us when we got sick. Something happened to us when we got those viruses, and if we could figure out what that was and fix it, perhaps we could return to the health we experienced prior to becoming ill, and that was our thinking. We were hesitant to agree that these were all anatomical problems, which made sense if you looked at our MRIs. In fact, our MRIs were a mess, which is typical for hypermobility. Uh, our discs are all over the place, and it, it did make sense. I was wearing a cervical collar for almost two years, almost full time. But I didn't think it was pure anatomy, especially when our eight-year-old son became sick. So the first breakthrough came when I started playing my flute, and I noticed a lot of my symptoms were much worse after I played my flute. My tremor, my hand tremor, my headache, that pain at the base of your skull radiating down your neck, I had a little bit of nausea that would increase after playing my flute. Now some people notice this when they're singing or when they're lifting weights, and that's called a Valsalva maneuver. When you perform a Valsalva maneuver, you're increasing your intracranial pressure. And that was my first clue that perhaps I had an issue with high intracranial pressure. Hmm. Then I took Florinaf, as many of us do for POTS, to see if increasing our blood volume would perhaps make us more functional and make me be able to be vertical longer. Took Florinaf and immediately that headache and that base of the neck pain 
was a thousand times worse. And I knew at that point, this is definitely high intracranial pressure. So let's take a look at the, the symptoms of high intracranial pressure. <sighs> So many of them, and they can be subtle, and they can come and go. Headache, that base of the neck pain, that low-level nausea, motion sickness, sometimes ringing of the ears. Sometimes we can just feel that pressure. You really can feel it. And that worsening of symptoms with, of Valsal with Valsalva maneuvers, the symptoms would get worse. That's a clue. So I decided at that point I really needed to try Diamox, which lowers intracranial pressure. I had taken it many times before when I'd go snow skiing, go up in the mountains. We take it for altitude sickness, for example. I knew I tolerated it well, and we had it in the office because being optometrists, we need it every now and then for an acute angle closure glaucoma case, for example. Popped a couple of those in my mouth that night, and what happened? That's right. The yeah, um, pressure went away overnight, and even more importantly, the symptoms of high intracranial pressure went away overnight. Also, and very important, all of the symptoms of craniocervical instability that I had, which were severe, and the symptoms of Chiari Zero that my son and I suffered also went away. He was nine years old, I think I see, when uh, he went on Diamox and overnight a lot of those disabling symptoms went away. So it did not make us well, but it was hugely helpful and it was also a clue as to what could be going on. Now we reached out to many of you because we thought we, were, we cannot be the only ones with this condition, right? Reached out to many of you and found out that indeed this was all over the place, not uncommon at all that we were exhibiting episodic high intracranial pressure. And that is the day the Driscoll theory was born. We knew we were onto something. So how is it that this has gotten missed for so long? And there's a couple reasons. One is that you see this MRI here on your left. This is a brain MRI. The dark areas there in the middle are the ventricles where CSF accumulates, right? These, are, these ventricles are enlarged. This is a form of hydrocephalus, which is easy to diagnose. From imaging, it jumps out at you, right? We don't have that form, OK? The other reason is we were not exhibiting true papilledema, which is swelling of the optic nerve head in the back of the eye. And this is a picture inside of an eye showing that center area, which is the optic nerve, that it is swollen. We didn't exhibit that. And even though we know that there is a condition that does not exhibit with papilledema and it still has high intracranial pressure, we call it IWAP, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, without papilledema. It is easy to forget that that exists without objective signs. We seem to fall into that category. The other reason this is getting missed, I believe, is that we have so many symptoms when we develop POTS that the symptoms of high intracranial pressure were getting lost in that mix. And part of it is because when we go to doctors, they want to know, what are your top, say, two problems? Doctor visits are problem-oriented, right? That's the way we have to do medicine. We can't look at 100 symptoms at once. That's just not realistic. And it, the pattern was not exhibited, which makes sense. The symptoms also mimic those of Chiari and craniocervical instability. And we know when we have hypermobility, we're more prone to exhibiting those conditions. So it's also easy to forget that those conditions could be from high intracranial pressure. Um, also, the treatment of Diamox can be a little bit tricky. Uh, we have to watch electrolytes. There's certain forms of Diamox that are more effective than others, for example. And some patients, their doctors would think that maybe it was high intracranial pressure, try Diamox and forget how to be sure that they're getting the proper form or that their electrolytes are okay first. When the patient didn't respond, they s assumed perhaps it wasn't high intracranial pressure. So it's easy, easy to miss. Now, again, it's very important to remember that the symptoms of high intracranial pressure mimic those of craniocervical instability and Chiari. Um, when I realized that indeed I responded beautifully to Diamox, as did my son, I started to think, 
could I have some propensity for having abnormally high intracranial pressure, perhaps from birth? And if so, did I have any symptoms throughout my life? And indeed, I always suffered from some level of motion sickness in the car, for example. I also couldn't get on a merry-go-round when all the other kids would get on merry-go-rounds. And it made me wonder if I had some high pressure to some degree throughout my life. And this was maybe the last straw that, that pushed me over the edge. Then I thought about our children. If they had a propensity for the same high intracranial pressure, how could we know that? But this is my thinking. Tell me what you think. But when babies are born, the skull plates don't fuse. They float, right? This is why babies have a soft spot on their heads. They're not hooked together yet, if you will. If the pressure increases before those skull plates are fused, the skull plates can spread out and absorb that pressure. And babies remain asymptomatic. But at the age of 15 to 18 months, the skull plates, plates fuse. What would happen at that point? Yeah, I presumed that that pressure then could no longer be absorbed by the skull plates, but instead it would be translated down into the brain. Perhaps we would see symptoms at about 15 to 18 months. And indeed, that's what happened with our son. He started to develop these fits of just uncontrollable crying and frustration. There was nothing we could do to make him feel better. We didn't know what was wrong. We knew something was clearly wrong. This was not his typical personality. We just had to wait for these episodes to pass. But what I did was I pulled out their baby books and looked at their head circumferences from when they were born to that 15 to 18 months as compared to their lengths and weights during the same time and plotted them out on a graph. And what I found was that their head circumferences went from slightly less than average straight up to 99 percentile or so, where their lengths and weights stayed about at the average level. That to me suggested that perhaps they were prone to high intracranial pressure and suffered from some of that since birth. It can't prove it, however, without lumbar punctures. But what we did was we released this information and reached out to many others who were able to send us head circumference data and found that this pattern was very, very typical. Now the problem is trying to publish this and prove that it was high intracranial pressure because maybe we just have big heads, right? I mean, it's possible, not likely, but, but possible. We don't want to do lumbar punctures on people who um, have abnormal collagen or connective tissue disorders if we can help it because we're more prone to poor healing and we can develop leaks, spinal leaks, that can end up being disabling in and of themselves. They just continue to recur. The other problem with some of the new research that came out was that opening pressures and lumbar punctures of children are not accurate determinants of high intracranial pressure. Sometimes we do have to go by presentation. That makes it tough. So what we went from there was trying to figure out what is the cause of this high intracranial pressure and what else is continuing to make us sick. 